everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and my guest tonight is Dr. Rosanne Oliveira, DVM, PhD. She is the founding director of the Integrative Medicine Program and an adjunct assistant professor at the Department of Public Health Sciences at the School of Medicine at the University of California, Davis blending a lifelong passion for food and nutrition with over 20 years of scientific experience in genetic research. Dr. Oliveira is devoted to educating people about how food and lifestyle choices can affect genetic expression. In other words, how genes are turned on and off and either cause disease or promote health. She is a native of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and has lived in the United States since 2003. So welcome, Rosanne, to Healthy Living. Thank you so much, AJ, for having me. It's always a pleasure talking to you. You know how much I love you and your work. Think, yeah, we, we actually met, I think it was about five years ago, of all places, at Dr. Esselstyn's house. Yes, it was. I was actually, I went to Cleveland to attend a conference for the Society of Integrative Oncology. And then when I wrote Anne and Dr. E, I said, I'll be in Cleveland. I'd love to see you. And then I was leaving to China, actually, and then I received an email from her, and I said, if you're coming to Cleveland, you cannot stay at a hotel. You have to stay at a house. Lucky. So, <laughs> yeah, so I went there, and I, saw, and I started having so much fun that the day we met, I was supposed to be at a conference, but then Anne started cooking lunch, and it smelled delicious, and everything looked delicious. And then Dr. E came from the clinic, and he was going to stay home um, to eat lunch while Anne was going out to meet you. And I said, I just cannot pass an opportunity to have lunch with Dr. E and have him all for myself and talk. Oh. And so I stayed there, and that's the reason why we met, because when Anne came back to their house, you're with her, and right. Everything else is history. We just became friends. I knew we were supposed to meet, and that was it. That is so great. I know, and I, I, that was just such a that, that was such, that was so fun. It was. It, I love. I love them. Yeah, they're they're great, aren't they? Yes, they are. And then I went they're. to see you at Whole Foods, and yep. that was it. And then it turns out you're, it turns out you're a West Coast gal. You're you're in Sa you're you know near Sacramento. Yes, I live in Davis, but the School of Medicine is in Sacramento. Well, so how did okay? So some you were you became a veterinarian and you have a PhD. So how did you get into what you're doing? I, I want to hear the story because that's so interesting. You you know you you came from Brazil a little over ten years ago, and how did you get to be doing what you're doing with genetic you know nutrition? That's so fascinating to me. Yeah, it's, I get a question a lot. How is it that a vet <laughs> is directed <laughs> into greater medicine, a school of medicine? So um, let's see. I'm going to try and make it as short as possible. Okay. Uh, my journey started back in 1988. I was 15, and that's when I became vegetarian. Uh, that was before I went to college. And it was because of my mom. My mom went, came home one day, looked at us. I remember, I don't know what made her decide, but she came back because she was in the kitchen. She looked at me and my sister and she said, I think we shouldn't be eating animals for ethical reasons. And my sister and I just looked at her and I said, sure, we'll do it with you. And that was it. And, uh, and it was just so, it was nice. I'm very thankful to my mom because, Six months before that, through her influence, my sister and I also stopped drinking soda, which is great. So mm -hmm. I think that was hard, and then just, you know, stop eating meat. It was not that hard. And it was not that particular day, you know, because it was just an idea she had. But then I remember in that same year, 1988, um, we went out with the whole family, and I remember ordering steak and fries, which at the time was my favorite dish. Any time we would go to a restaurant, I wanted steak and fries. And just saying that sounds so surreal, you know, it's not me. <laughs> yeah. It's part of the, my past life. That, um, and I remember getting the plate and looking the steak in front of me, and I remember thinking, this is the last steak I'm going to eat. And that was it. That mm -hmm. was what we said. But 
Uh, interesting enough, nobody would discuss veganism in in Brazil. So to me, being vegetarian is all you could do, you know, to be nice with the animals. And not, not until I moved to the U.S. that I start hearing the word veganism, I say, oh, you can actually go beyond, you know, you mm -hmm. can give up eggs and dairy and all of that. So, but that was until 19, 1988. And then when I was um, to select to go to college, then I could select between going get an MD or DVM. And at the time, I thought I didn't have the psychological strength to see my patients by. You know, I just said, I just, I, I think I'm gonna feel a failure if uh, I try my best and the patients die in front of me. So I thought wrongly that would be easier to deal with animals than it would be to deal with uh, human beings, but it was actually the opposite. It's so much harder yeah. to work with animals. Uh, there's no respect for animal lives. You know, animals get sick, and then the owners, even owners for cats and dogs sometimes, they just come and they say, I'm supposed to spend $200 on antibiotics. I don't have the money, uh, so I don't want the dog anymore. And so what are you supposed to do? I don't know, give it away. Put it, you know, put it down. I, I, so that's that's what happened. That's what the reality. But so what happened is that um, when I was in vet school, then seven years later, I moved to Germany to work in clinics. At the time, because I was vegetarian, I knew I didn't want to work with small animals. I knew I want to work with large animals. So I went to do clinics with horses and dairy cows. They were my passion because I was you no know, true vegeta uh, vegetarian. I thought that my work or my life's mission was to produce more dairy so more people could eat more cheese and more ice cream. Mm -hmm. That was my mission, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then when I got to Germany, I fell in love with research. I went there to work as a clinician, and I fell in love with research. And then for the past 20 years, that's what I've been doing. I started with doing research on genetics of pathogens, you know, microorganisms that cause diseases, viruses, bacteria, parasites. Mm -hmm. And then eventually in 2003, when I moved to the U.S., I came to do research in cancer initiation and progression um, following a, um, infection by a retrovirus. But at the time, there was another project going on in the lab that I joined at the University of Illinois that was studying the effect of a high-fat diet on animals, dairy cows, that had specific genotypes. So, as a matter of fact, the, the research was to see how much, how a high-fat diet would cause metabolic diseases in cows. And it just so happened that we were checking gene expression. Then we noticed that cows that had specific genes and ate a high-fat diet, those two things combined, they were more likely to develop metabolic diseases. So it was a big aha for us. And, you know, like just those coincidences in life, like the way the day the two of us met, um, I picked up a copy of the China study from the library. I mm -hmm. expected something completely different. I had no idea mm -hmm. what the book was about. And what happened was there, so as you can imagine, so there I was, I was seeing changes in gene expression related to cancer initiation and progression in one project, my own project. In another project I was collaborating with, I was seeing changes in gene expression related to diet and fat, right? Diet, fat, and genes in this other project. And here I was, I was reading the China study, and then it was telling the scientific discoveries by this researcher from Cornell, researcher from Cornell University, who started his career with dairy cows like me, then worked on cancer research like me, mm. and did nutritional studies like me. <laughs> so the author we all know is Dr. T. Colin Campbell, yep. and he was bashing my favorite food. So <laughs> I was really upset to read the book, um, but we had so much in common, you know, our background, the type of research we are doing, I was intrigued, and then I said, you know what, 
I'm going to read this book to the end. But something else was also driving my desire to finish the book. And I say, you know, I'm a scientist too. I know that by the end of the book, I'll have enough evidence myself to disprove anything that he's saying in this book, and then I can continue <laughs> my life eating dairy and <laughs> never think about this book again. But the more I read, the more I liked it. <laughs> so, oh, and interesting enough, I was reading this book. I picked the, I picked the book up when I was traveling, so I was, I was not at home when I was reading. But as I was reading the book, I was eating ice cream the whole time. And when I closed the book, I still had a pint of ice cream next to me. And then I remember it was like Sunday evening, it was November 30, 2008, and I closed the book, and, and I remember asking myself, what am I going to do? And my first response was, I'm going to wait. I'm going to change my diet next year. I don't have to change it now. I don't have any disease, you know. I haven't been diagnosed with cancer. I don't have heart disease. I'm young. I don't really think I need to lose weight. So there's no incentive for me to change. But at the same time, I knew there were people in my life that were battling breast cancer, prostate cancer, heart disease. And I thought if I recommend this book to them, They'll, they're going to look at me and say, you don't know how hard it is, you know, to give up dairy. And the only thing I would be able to tell them, yes, you're right. So I said, why don't I do for six months so I just know how hard it is. Then I can go back to eating dairy for the rest of my life. But at least when I recommend the book to someone, they won't be able to say, you don't know how hard it is. And I'll say, yes, I know, because I did it for six months. <laughs> so it's been seven years and the rest is history, as they say. But that's how I became plant-based. But I was still at the University of Illinois and doing research with diet and genetics. And then there was this opportunity to start the integrative medicine program at UC Davis. And because of my research background, when I came to be interviewed, I said that my desire was to do exactly that, you know, cha uh, show how diet can change gene expression and can either cause disease or promote health. And the physicians, the parents who liked it, uh, other integrative medicine programs at other UCs, you know, UC Irvine and UC SF, UC San Francisco, UCLA, um, and UC San Diego, they all focus in, on different parts of integrative health, and they all focus on the clinical aspect of it. You know, they already want to offer acupuncture, massage, and all of this. And they say, no, let's do something different. In our case, we're going to, going to focus on education and research. And the main focus is plant-based diets because nobody is doing genetics or genomics research related to plant-based diet. And that's the mission, and that's how I got my job, and that's what I've been doing for the past four years. It sounds, it sounds terrific. You know, what I wanted to ask you when you mentioned cows eating a high-fat diet, how the heck can a cow eat a high-fat diet? Don't cows eat grass? And uh, I don't understand how a cow would even get a high-fat diet. Yeah, as well, because we feed it to them. <laughs> so I always so, so like the story. The story is the following. A cow would originally only eat grass, but that if it's a cow, it's not a cow that we are raising to produce milk. If it's, it's a cow you we are raising to produce milk, you're going to feed the cow anything that it will allow the cow to produce the most amount of milk throughout the year, oh. correct? So we change the natural diet of the cow, but there's something... Yeah, so a cow has, that's something that I remember the first time I told my sister, she had no idea, and it may be that some people that are listening to us today also don't know that. For a cow to produce milk, a cow has to be pregnant the whole time, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a cow is pregnant, and the, the first year that a calf is pregnant, it doesn't produce milk. But once it gives birth, it's going to produce milk the following year, but then you have to make the cow get pregnant again 
so the following year there's more milk. So every year a new baby calf, every year the cow can produce milk. But there's something that happens and happens in human beings, within cows more so, is two months prior to parturition when the cow gives birth, you have to dry the cow. So the cow produces milk for a um, certain number of months, but two months before it's supposed to give birth, you have to dry. You cannot milk the cow anymore. Why? Because the last two months is when the baby is going to be doubling in size and the cow goes into something that needs all the resources that it needs, right? So, <laughs> And then once the cow gives birth, she goes into something that, and it happens in human beings, too, any <laughs> mammalian female that gives birth. Once the baby's out, you enter in, in a state called um, negative energy balance, right? I've seen uh, some of those superstars saying, the best diet I've ever had was breastfeeding my baby because it happens. You lose weight like crazy, you know, because mm -hmm. no matter how much you eat, it's not enough calories for you and for you to feed your baby. So wow. it happens with cows too, and cows lose a lot of weight. So what happens is the, the amount of milk you produce on the first day that the cow gives birth is the peak, is the most milk that you produce for the next year. So they say, okay, if the cow is going to start losing tons of weight in the first month of after delivering the baby, what happens if we make the cow fat, super fat, have excess weight before giving birth? So then we, when you give birth, birth and lose its weight, is that it's one weight. And that's when um, people that work with cow nutrition started giving more energy. And the easiest way to give more energy is by increasing the amount of fat. So right, it's a but long the, but how do they, how do they, what do they give the cow specifically to give it more fat? Because grass probably doesn't have a lot of fat. No. You know, to tell you the truth, I don't remember. I would say it's like mix of oils. Wow. And... Um, there's also, I know the cows eat a certain, a fair amount of corn and a, certain, a fair amount of soybeans. Soybeans have a lot of fat, but yeah. I, can, I can't remember. It's been such a, like, 25 years that I study, sure. you know, animal nutrition. Mm -hmm. But I would think it is some sort of um, um, oils or combination. Or, but I'm not sure. I can't remember. I'm sorry. Well, I, but that's I, I just find that fascinating because, you know, Dr. McDougall's been saying for 40 years, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. So I guess that applies to cows as well as humans. Yes, that applies to everybody. <laughs> right? well, you know, it, it's, I love your story because it, 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 so many people, it was the, reading the China study that really was what really convinced them about, you know, the healthfulness of not having dairy and, and eating a plant-based diet. So that's great that, that that was also your uh, turning point as well. And I love what you just said about, the, uh, you know, I never thought about breastfeeding to lose weight. Am I too old to start that diet? Because that sounds <laughs> That sounds, that sounds good to me. You know, um, one of the first times I heard you speak was at the McDougal Advanced Study Weekend, and I was so fascinated by your talk, and that was really the reason I wanted to interview you, Roseanne, because I honestly didn't understand a lot of it, but it was, it was the, 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 the things you were doing with your identical twin sister was fascinating to me, and if, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what you're doing, because it maybe can explain some of the, 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 the things that we want people to know about fat. And then you talked about this gene that I had never heard of, but now I've researched it, and apparently you can get tested to see what, what variation you have. And I'd, I'd love to know as much about that as you're willing to share. Okay. We'll start off from the beginning. Um, I was, as you said, I, as you just said, I was born an identical twin. And up until our 20s, I believe it was like 1995, my sister and I were truly identical in every sense, right? We, we lived in, under the same roof. We ate a very similar diet. The only difference is that she went to law school while I went to vet school to get my DVM, but everything else was the same. And then in 1995, 
she graduated from law school. But at the same time that I moved to Germany to live there, and what happened is that we both start changing our diet. We were not living in the same roof, and then she started, you know how lawyers are, they start going <laughs> before when they're students, they eat every meal at home, and then when they, became, and they become lawyers, they eat every meal outside of the house, right? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, all these meetings and everything. And I went to Germany. I continued to be a student. And interesting enough, we, when you think about Germany, we think about dairy, too, like the same with Netherlands. But dairy is very expensive there. Mm-hmm. And I was a vegetarian when I moved to Germany. I ate rice and vegetables. Um, and in Germany, there you don't buy by the weight like here. You buy by the slices, the good cheese. is like, I want two slices of this cheese. So I would buy two, three slices of a cheese. So I started eating even less dairy. And I never like eggs. So. Then when I came back to Brazil a few months later, then I noticed that my sister was maybe 10, 15 pounds heavier than me. And that surprised me, you know, like in six months and that much change, or maybe it was even less, because I, I went and I came back, I went back to Brazil and back to Germany a few times. And then what happened is that for the past 20 years, the gap just increased. And it's interesting, you know, sometimes they say, the truth is in front of you and you cannot see. Here I am, I'm a geneticist, but I'm not working on obesity, so I'm not paying attention, right? And then back when it was 2012, I stopped and I said, wait a second, how is it possible that two people that have identical genes, and those genes would include the genes for obesity, can, can be 40 to 50 pounds apart for such a long time, that's not possible, you know. When we think about obesity, we always like to blame the genes. We have identical genes. The only thing that can happen is the food choices that we make. But because we were living in different places, you know, different states, different countries, never get a real chance to stop and I say, hey, hey, what's going on? So in 2012, then I invited my sister to come back to the U.S. because when I first moved in 2003, she came with me. But then she, after six, five, six years, she went back to Brazil. So, but in 2012, I said, would you come back to the U.S. and be here with me in California? And because here's one thing. For everybody that is listening to us now, the ones that already made the transition, the ones that are thinking about it, one of the big challenges that people talk about is that when they don't cook themselves, and when they don't know how to cook, it's very hard to make the transition. So that was one of the reasons why I asked her to come, because my sister doesn't like to cook or doesn't know. She, I think she would even like to cook, but she didn't learn the same way I did. And then I said, so if you come here, you don't have to worry about cooking. So all you have to do is, whatever I'm eating, you eat the same. And just for the fun of it, um, I'm going to get some blood tests. We're going to do blood tests. We're going to check our microbiome. And I'm also going to check some of our genes, you know, some, some of our genes, just to show people that we are truly identical. Because the first time I gave this talk and I said, these are the blood markers from the past 20 years, and this is what's going on, people say, how can you prove that you are truly identical? And that's why I went to do the genetic test. But then I, I, the more I dig in, the more I realize, oh, my God, look at this gene. And look, we have all of these genes for obesity, including APOA5. But here I am, thin, not having weight problems at all, but my sister is having. So it's, I don't want to give people the false impression that obesity is one gene thing because it's not. There's more than 130 candidate genes that have been already identified, more than another 90 mutations that have been identified. Many of them don't even have a gene that can be associated with a mutation yet. It's just a mutation they found in the, on the DNA. So, but then this particular gene caught my attention because it was already being reported in, um, in a study done with patients in the Framingham cohort. 
that if someone eats more than 30% of the daily calories from fat, that BMI and weight will increase. And this is increase will be dose dependent or they, what they call linear, meaning the more fat you eat, the higher your the risk that your risk is higher, that your BMA is, BMI is going to be high, and that the, your risk is higher that you're going to be overweight and obese. And I say, boom, that's it. It's fat. And I was always always looking for something. You know, the the big carbs versus oils debate. And I think that's it. That's how we can prove it is. And then if we look the majority of the genes that are related to obesity, they either are related to functions in the central nervous system, especially the brain, or they are related to either insulin or lipid metabolism. But many of them are, are related to fat metabolism. Lipid is fat, right? Metabolism. And, I, and I, that was it. I, I was fascinated. And that was the APO A5 gene. But it turns out that this gene, 90%, almost 90% of the population will have the same mutation. No, it's not even a mutation. It's, it's going to have the same genotype as me and my sister. Some, some people have one copy. Some people are going to have two copies of the gene. But it doesn't matter because if you, most people will have two copies, which is my case, which is my sister's case, and it's a clear-cut association. If you have the gene and you eat more than 30% of your daily calories from fat, your BMI will be higher, your wait. weight will be higher. And, okay, so, and something else, before, before I forget, and then I allow you, then wait. you ask me. The association is higher, and they broke it down into different fatty acids. So they broke, is that an association? This is for total amount of fat. But how about monosaturated fats or saturated fats or uh, polyunsaturated fats. And they found an association with monounsaturated fats. And with mono, the percentage was lower. Anytime you eat more than 11% of your daily calories from MUFAs or the monounsaturated fatty acids, your BMI and your weight will likely go up. Okay. Wait, wait. Slow down a little because I'm taking notes. Okay. Because first, you, okay, okay. Because first you said thirty percent of your calories from fat, and then you said eleven percent. So, it, 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 are you saying that it's the type of fat that matters in this thirty and eleven percent? No, the thirty percent is total fat, no matter 30%. what. So that's total fat, and that's not just from like added fat. That's just from the fat that's also say in the food that you're eating. Yes. It can come from olives. It can come from avocados. It doesn't matter if it's more than thirty percent. Mm -hmm. then BMI and weight will go up. But then they, they break the type of fat up and say, is there a stronger association with a specific type versus another or how it is? And they say no, but any time, the only association they were able to identify is any time that you, of this 30, let's say, if of this 30% that you were eating, if you're eating, let's say you're eating 30%, but you're eating more than 11% from monosaturated fat, you will likely increase too. Okay, all right. And, and where did you get this? Is from this is from the research with your sister that you did, or is this this is just no? A, a fact? This okay. this was identified um, through another study done with a cohort here from the U.S. called. Uh, Framingham, I think, heart disease cohort. They just, it's just people, you know, this, this studies work like this. People say, yes, I'm going to participate in the study, and then for the next 10 years, 20 years, from time to time, they submit a questionnaire saying what they ate. And when they first signed up for the study, they probably gave blood. And then any group who wants to do research just needs to then talk to whoever is responsible for a specific cohort, or cohort is a group of people that are participating in a giving experiment, and I say, 
do you give me permission to use this sample to analyze this specific gene? So the data exists. The data is there of what people are eating, you know, the percentage of fat, the percentage of protein and carbohydrates they are eating, and then they just have to go and map the gene. So that's what this group did. In my case, I just went to get uh, my genotype my genotyping done with me and my sister, and then I saw this gene there, and then because I knew the effect, I just wanted to confirm that we are part of the 90% of the population that is lucky enough to have a gene that says if you eat more than 30% of the calories from fat, your BMI will increase and your weight will increase. <laughs> but how, how good is that that you know this? Then all you have to do is make sure you eat less than 30%. Right. Correct? And so, and so wh if, if anybody wants to get the testing to see if they have this gene, to see how much fat they could eat, how do they get it, who orders it, and what is the name of the test? Um, that's a tricky question. Anybody can get the test, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't test just this single gene. It has over 900,000 mutations and many thousand genes, but the results come in a format that right now you have to be a geneticist to understand. The one I got it done. I don't know if there's another way of getting done, but I think, in my opinion, is beyond the point because if I'm telling you that 90% of the population has this combination of genes, it means that only 10% of the population will be lucky enough that 30% of fat will not make their BMI increase. So I wouldn't waste money. So sure. I know everybody gets, everybody gets curious and say, I want to know, I want to know. But the thing with obesity, AJ, that you have to understand, and everybody else also, it may be that you got lucky with this particular gene, and you are part of the 10%. But then there's another 130 other genes that may affect the way you metabolize fat, that the way you, you know, insulin works, and many other genes in your brain related to how hypothalamus is controlling uh, society and appetite. Mm -hmm. So you may be lacking one gene, but it's not one gene that matters. Is a system. The same way we think of food as a system, genetics is a system. One gene doesn't tell the whole story. I use one gene just to make a point, mm -hmm. but you would ha it's so complex uh, that maybe you are lucky in one gene, but li the likelihood that the mix of your genes won't allow you to eat 50% of fat is very, very high. <laughs> okay. That's the point. That, that It's just so interesting because there's just so many arguments about, you know, whether we should be eating a low-fat diet or a low-carb diet. And, you know, I'm, on, I'm in the low-fat camp, high-carb camp, but so many people feel that, you know, the best way, the healthiest way to eat is, you know, a paleo diet. And mm -hmm. I, it's, it, I don't understand where they're getting their research from that this is the best way or even the healthiest way. And I certainly don't understand how it's really a weight loss diet, you know. Yeah, it's very easy because of the way clinical research is done. What you and I call low fat is not the same as it's called low fat. So back in the 1980s, there was this report on the National Academy of Science in which they said, so how much fat should we recommend Americans to eat? And at the time, they said Americans are eating about 40% fat. How about we say they should eat 30% and below, meaning it's the direction we should go, 30 and below, but for whatever reason, people understood 30% is the limit. So they said any time you eat 30% of your total calories and 30% of the total calories from fat, you should be considered to be in a low-fat diet. But here in the U.S., most people that follow a low-fat diet is eating even a little bit more of that, 35%. And even this study that I just mentioned to you about the APOA5 gene, 
they use 30% as the threshold to, for the amount of fat that you eat to see if your BMI and your weight would go up. But they use 30% because that's what everybody uses. I wonder if they use 20% threshold, if they would see the same dose-dependent response, meaning if you eat more than 20% fat, your BMI will increase. I don't know. I cannot know. But I would love to repeat the research so I can tell you for sure. So I think mm-hmm. maybe the, the biggest problem is this mistake that a low-fat diet is a fat, it's a, it's a diet between 30 and 35%. So if you go back to all the studies that are done comparing low-fat versus low-carb diets, fat is never ever low, and that's the problem to begin with. So if I see a new study coming out and I say low fat, I go to the part where they describe the percentage of fat, and I say 30 30%, I don't even read the rest because right. it's wrong to begin with, and that's the problem. I haven't found a single study done talking about comparing low fat versus low carb diet showing a true low fat diet. Sure. I don't know of one. And that's the problem. Right, right. That's so interesting. Because I know my journey was until I went on a, a low-fat diet, I was never able to lose weight on any program. So, you know, I, I, I mean, that's just how it was for me, you know. Yes, I do. But then you wanted to talk specifically about the nuts in your diet? Well, I know. Yeah, well, you, you know, uh, nuts, yeah, that's a very controversial, you know, I just, I was just, <laughs> that came up just recently at the McDougal Advanced Study Weekend because people, it seems to be a very heated topic, you know, people just get very attached to their nuts and whether or not they can eat nuts and lose weight or not gain weight or not gain as much weight, so I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's not, I'm going to give you the answer that Michael Greger gives me when I say, what are your thoughts on it? I say, oh, my thoughts. This is what science says. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what happens is the same way I just told you that what researchers are defining low fat is actually not low fat. What happens with nut research is that all the research that has been published on the benefits of eating nuts, health benefits, right, on whether or not consuming nuts will increase weight are done with people that eat traditional diets, are done with people that eat the standard American diet or the Mediterranean diet or any other diet you can think of. And these people that eat diets, they are not low-fat, whole-food, plant-based diets, They are diets in which people are consuming calorie-dense foods already. So when you give them nuts, nuts have very high society level. So you eat nuts and you feel full faster than if you eat some other foods. And there's something called dietary compensation theory, which means when you eat nuts, you tend not to eat something else in your diet. And everybody knows that. It does research in nutrition. So there are studies showing if you eat, if you add peanuts or almonds to your diet, you can be between 54 to 68, sometimes 80% of the calories of the nuts that you are eating, unconsciously you were you're compensating those calories by not eating something else only because you're not hungry. Mm. Is that clear? Absolutely. So that's, it's, it's a compensation. So, And if you are giving nuts to people, they are eating, like I said, diets. They are very high in calorie-dense foods. You give a high-calorie-dense food, which is not, it's going to replace another calorie-dense food, and sometimes it replaces nicely, it replaces oils or it replaces some animal fat. So in the end, it's positive. So what happens is they say nuts sometimes may help someone lose weight, but again, the studies that I've seen that are the ones that people are eating a lot of nuts. Mm-hmm. But because they're eating a lot of the nuts, they are eating less of 
oils, and animal products just because they feel good. It's a compensation, and, and they have to take that into consideration. And right. the other people, they gain weight, but not to the extent that are expected, I'd say. If you eat that, this am, X amount of nuts equals Y amount of calories. So mm-hmm. then it's expected that you're going to gain eight pounds after six months, but instead of eight pounds, you gain two pounds. And that's something else that people, when they're talking about nuts, they mix up. They say nuts don't cause gain weight. They don't cause the expected gain weight. So instead of gaining eight pounds, you gain two. And for some people, this is good enough, all right? Yeah. Uh-huh. For some people, it's flat. They don't gain weight. But like I said, it's just because it's happening is they're compensating with some other foods. But if you give nuts to someone that is following a low, a true low-fat, whole-food, plant-based diet, because there are people that think they are following a low-fat, uh, whole-food, plant-based diet, but they're not. But if you give nuts to someone that really is eating less than 20%, 15%, or of their calories from fat, if you give them nuts, then and it's more than an ounce a day, and then it's likely they're going to gain weight because you would, in, this, in this case, you're going to compensate. Instead of eating a low-calorie dense food, which we usually do we by eating fruits and vegetables and whole grains and whole legumes, you were then adding a high calorie dense food, which is nuts. So that that's what happened, and that's so. There's to me, there's no mystery. It's very clear cut. Right. You know, one of the things that I I'm not seeing addressed in this research, and not really talked about too much in our plant based community, is food addiction. And I you know I've only worked with about two thousand people now, but I find that they just can't moderate the use of nuts. And so to tell a food addict. That to have an ounce of nuts a day is like telling an alcoholic we'll just have a thimble full of vodka. It just doesn't work because for most of these people, myself included, nuts and any high-fat food are what we call trigger foods that just perpetuate overeating and create the desire to eat more high-fat foods. That's true. No, you're right. Um, and then there's the fact that some people may be transitioning to a whole food plant-based diet and they don't know that it's better to eat those nuts whole and raw, so they're getting the ones that are salted, then then you're going to eat a little bit more, <laughs> or yes. you're mm-hmm. making the sauces and the dressing, so you're eating a lot more than you would if you're just counting the nuts. It only works for you not to gain weight if you're counting the numbers. All right, you can eat an ounce of almonds, 23, so you count 12 <laughs> almonds in the morning, 11 almonds in the evening, and that's it. And you hide the package. Otherwise, it's going to interfere with weight loss. And interesting enough, if you go back to a lot of the people talking about low-carb or this other diet, they all say, if you're eating nuts, pay attention to the amount. That's something that it's kind of universal now. It's, that's right. It's supposed to be. That's something that we have in common with sometimes paleo with the slow people in the slow carb diet and people and when you talk about dairy we in agreement with the paleo people right they don't feel like people should be drinking milk or eating dairy so there's always good in every diet out there so we always have to talk about the good too so we see if a lot, a lot more people then come to our <laughs> to our side of the diet spectrum in, yeah, absolutely. Well, what I like about my diet that doesn't include nuts is I don't have to weigh or measure anything, and I pretty much eat all I want, as much as I want, whenever I want, of just fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. Yes. But one thing I, I wanted to say, like, for instance, you used to use a lot of nuts in your cooking, and it was yes. great for someone that is just transitioning because yes. they will miss they will miss a lot of the fat, and that, you know, the fullness the fat gives in recipes. So when I transitioned, I wasn't relying on the mighty beans only because, you know, I'm from Brazil. In Brazil, everybody cooks their own beans at home. 
and I didn't want I didn't know how to use a pressure cooker and I didn't want to eat beans from a can. I'm over that right now. I eat beans from a can. <laughs> but before I didn't want to and so I relied very heavily on almonds. I ate almonds all day long and I lost weight. I like I said, I didn't change to lose weight, but I lost weight. I lost about ten pounds and I was eating almonds every day. But why? Like I said, I was compensating. I was replacing almonds for something that it had even more calories, even more fat, which is dairy because I ate, you know, I started the day with yogurt, then I had cheese sandwich, and I finished my day with ice cream almost every day. And now I wouldn't eat any of that, but instead I would eat almonds, tons of my bags of almonds. But that's the reason. But, on, but then it comes to a point where your body – then gets to a weight, and they say, okay, this is a safe weight, and then you were there for a long time. That's probably what happened with you. Then you stay there for a while, but then once you're ready to remove the nuts, your weight's going to go down again because then you're going to be relying on, like you said, the fruits, the vegetables, the whole grains, and the legumes, which are um, lower to medium calorie than foods, and that's what's yes. going on. Right. You know, I can talk a little bit about your blog I, I, and how people could subscribe to it because it really is a wonderful blog and I'd love people to know about it. Yes. We started our blog in February and very easy because we worked at UC Davis, University of California, Davis, and we are integrative medicine. The website is UCD from UC Davis, UCDIM for integrative medicine, dot com. And then if people visit the blog, right on the top, there's a gray, now it's a gray, it used to be red, there's a gray bar where it says share the love or join us. So if you want to receive our blog posts and our recipes, if you put your name down and submit, then you come into our newsletter and then you receive. We post between two or three articles every week. We try to do the following. We try to do at least one article a week which is covering something that people are always asking. As you can imagine, I receive a lot of questions, right? So nuts is something that, believe it or not, when I stopped, when I ended my talk at McDougal, someone came talk to me and I say, but how about the articles and all the science saying that you lose weight? And I say, ever since I was at McDougal, I said, I have to write an article or not. So that's how the idea is coming. People email us too. So if you're listening to us and you have a specific question, go to the blog, see if we answer that already. But if not, then just send us your suggestions because I love it. I love to write about all of that. And then we try to write one article on something that is related to plant-based eating, but not necessarily uh, about nuts or fruits. And right now you're running a series, and we just posted a blog post yesterday on changing habits, because then it's all about the mental aspect of it, right? It goes beyond. It's just how you change beliefs, how with the, the steps that you need to follow, how about to get more willpower. And then on Sundays we post about... Uh, facts, you know, things that are going on right now and how is it that they can be related to plant-based living and we always share a recipe on Sunday. So I almost often tell people, you know, you should expect to receive two if not three emails from me every week. But that's all. All I send is this. It's just to, uh, to tell you a new blog post is up and then you click and you go there and you read it. Yeah. Now, you have a conference that you're involved with that sounds really great in Las Vegas in December. Yes, it is. Um, I've been co-chairing this conference with Dr. Michael Roizen, who is the chief wellness officer at the Cleveland Clinic and Dr. Esselstyn's boss, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the conference is on... In preventive and integrative medicine. Every year we cover different topics. And this year I'm very happy that we are focusing on discussing plant-based eating as it relates to aging. 
Then Dr. Axelstein is a speaker, and Ann Axelstein is going to speak to I'm very excited about that. I'm going to be speaking about plant-based diets also in aging. There's another professor who used to work at UC Davis, but now he moved to Kaiser in Oakland, who is also going to be talking about plant-based eating as it relates to chronic pain. And there's the researcher from the Cleveland Clinic who was the first to describe the whole story about TMAO, right? So how is it that eating animal foods and how this animal food is digested by the gut microorganism, you know, our gut flora, how the, um, the end product from that digestion is what increases the chance of a terrorist, not even increases the chance, but it's actually what causes a sclerosis. So he's going to be there too. And there's a whole session on microbiome, which is super, super hot. It's what everybody's talking yeah, about I, now. You had mentioned that earlier when you were talking about when you started your research with your sister. Just if, if briefly, why, why is that like the thing du jour? Like everybody's, what is this and why is everybody talking about that now? Well, it's very easy because we eat certain foods that we cannot digest, correct? So yes. the food that we eat that is not digest, most of it then gets to our intestines, and then when it gets there, it's our gut for this gut microorganism that we have that is going to then further digest the food. And this is... It, this is new because all that we know about how a specific ingredient is broken down gets all the way until it reaches the gut flora. After that, we don't know what what are the the end, what we call metabolites. They are produced by this this microorganism. So, like I just gave you the example. They said, okay, we, you eat animal foods and likely you're, you're getting atherosclerosis and increasing your risk of heart, heart disease because of the fat or because of the cholesterol, right, saturated fat, or is the protein. But now what they're showing, it goes beyond that because there are certain elements of the digestion that when the bacteria digest it further, it's going to produce what is actually going to uh, cause atherosclerosis. And it's the same for everything else. So everything that we eat matters. And, and it makes sense now that bacteria digest cellulose, right? Bacteria can digest parts of plant foods that we cannot digest. If we, if, we, if we go back to talk about the cows that we talked at the beginning of this conversation, and it's my chance to maybe correct a few people <laughs> that are listening, One, and I think I'm going to write a blog post about it. One of the things that I don't like when I hear people say, oh, you know, cows eat grass, and they are strong, they don't eat calcium, so why not cut the middleman, which is the cow, and eat grass instead? And I say, this is super wrong because cows have four stomachs. They are ruminants, and we have a completely different digestive system, so it's wrong. Never ever say that again, that you're cutting the middleman because you, <laughs> you would never be able to eat grass. Yeah. And survive the way a cow does. So that's wrong. I've, I've actually been I've actually been guilty of saying that, so now I won't say that anymore. <laughs> don't don't. And, and then because what happens is cow has this gigantic has four stomachs. The biggest one, the first one, is called the rumen, and that's where their bacteria resides. So cow eats grass, but a cow cannot digest the grass just by using the enzymes in the stomach, the same way we wouldn't be able to. But the grass then is accumulated in this big first stomach, and then the bacteria digest it. And mm -hmm. how ruminates is gross. The rumination means that the, they eat the grass, the grass goes inside the stomach, then the bacteria starts, you know, digesting, 
and then this goes back to their mouth, then chew a little more and goes back and it's a sticker. It's disgusting, but that's what happens. We don't have this mechanism. So whatever we eat that is plant food fiber, you know, the what we call the insoluble fiber, the things that we cannot digest, they are feast for our gut flora. So then when we talk about why is it so important to eat whole fruits, whole vegetables, whole grains, whole legumes, because when they are whole, they get to intestine and they are digested by our gut flora. And the things that we wouldn't be able to absorb as nutrition now are available to us. And that's where all the health is coming from. Mm. And that's why it's so important to eat high-fiber foods and less fat. Wow. So what are you doing with the medical school to get the, the message of plant-based across? Or are you doing anything with them? Well, we are. So first, when we first started working here, what we did is, uh, well, I thought, I'm new. I cannot just come across and start saying, yeah, eat a plant-based diet. So I started inviting all our friends. Um, every three months, we invited a different friend. So Dr. Esperstein was the first one. Then came Dr. Campbell. Then came Dr. McDougal. Came Dr. Uh, Royce. And we're going to invite, eventually we're going to invite Dr. Gregor to come too. So then the message was not coming from me, and we did a very nice event. It was like a whole day event in which we had the physicians come, like Dr. Esselstyn would come. He would give a grand round lecture. For those of you who are not in the medical uh, system, it's lectures that can give you continuing medical education credits because every physician is required to continue to learn throughout their career. So they need to show that they are continue to see lectures and learning. And and what we were gonna what we used to do and we're gonna go back to doing is we would have a nice plant based lunch in which we would invite a few of the physicians working in that area and would allow the physicians then to ask questions to the speaker without being in front of staff or nurses or students because nobody wants to ask a question about plant-based diet in front of everybody and they say, ah, you know, it's going to show that I don't know. So we made it safe for the physicians to learn from all of this wonderful, uh, you know, researchers and physicians that started before us, McDougal, Essos thing, and it was very successful. We, start, successful. we started having nurses and staff and physicians all changing their diet slowly. And then one of the physicians that changed his diet, he started teaching medical students that in an elective uh, course. And now that he left UC Davis, I'm responsible for that class, so I'm teaching medical students plant-based nutrition. And unfortunately, it's still an elective class, meaning only the medical students who are interested in learning more about nutrition will take. But all of them say, I wish this was, this was mandatory. And I say, it's going to get to the day that is mandatory. And to them, you are lucky that you already know. So that's what we've been doing. But we want to do more for sure. Well, I would love to come to speak to them. I spoke at a medical school once in Ohio, and, and I loved it. They were they were first-year students, so they hadn't been uh, poisoned yet, you know. <laughs> and it was, yeah. it was fun. I did but, part cooking demo and part lecture, and I, I, really, I really enjoyed that. I always told you I wanted to come and give you a lecture here because they have a hands-on experience, and you're such a great speaker. What I was going to mention is this elective that I'm responsible for that I'm teaching now. I get students from all years, first, second, third, and fourth. I have two students from fourth year. I, I really admire them because they don't have to be there. You know, they are in clinics already, but they sign up because they said, I don't want to graduate without knowing this, and they're coming. So I'm very thankfully grateful for that, and they're great students. Yeah, it sounds great. Well, I, I can't believe how fast this hour went by. So is there any uh, final thoughts you want to add? And once again, maybe tell people how to get in touch with you and subscribe to your wonderful blog. Yeah, so one thing that I was going to mention is if people haven't read 
anything about calorie density, which is, you know, the basis of everything we've been discussing. And one of the reasons why a whole food plant-based diet works and helps people keep a healthy weight, um, we have a, a, a fridge magnet that when we give lectures live, we give it away, but if not, we give people the chance to get a PDF and then print and then put it on the fridge if they want. So if they want to go to a specific website, I'm going to say now, they'll, they'll get this fridge magnet, and then they will be automatically entering our newsletter, and then they'll receive emails from us every time we have a new blog post up. So, and then the website is? Like I said before, it's UCD, UC Davis, ucdim.com forward slash magnet. And that's ah. all you have to do. That's fantastic. Thank you. So any chance you'll ever write a book, Roseanne? Because you, you, the stuff you talk about is a little, it's so technical that I, I'm going to have to listen to this again, but any chance you'll have put in a book? Yes, uh, there we are planning on writing a book, of course. I did my best, but just down to Texaco. I do a better job when I'm writing than yeah. when I'm speaking. But I hope everybody uh. understood. And, but please email. If you go to the blog, there's a contact page. You can send emails if you have questions, if you have suggestions. Like I said, I love suggestions. And, can you, and I will, something that I can say before we hang up here is that we are planning to start podcast so that videos, not interviews, so that in each podcast I can explain something about genetics and food, but in a way that is very easy to understand, you know, like with different words and it's visual so that it's better. And hopefully at the beginning of next year this podcast will be available and then you'll be able to learn without having to listen to me. Terrific. And if people are interested in attending the plant-based conference in December with Anne and Esselstyn and Dr. Esselstyn and yourself and Dr. Royzen, how would they uh, find out more about that? Yeah, they have to I, – I would just Google, you know, Cleveland Clinic, uh, CME, CME, and just – or just write, you know better, just write on Google, Royzen Conference. 2015, and the first heat is going to be there. Then you can read the agenda, uh, register. It's super fun. You know, we are always there. Dr. Lester's things, always talking to everybody. We are always available. We get to meet us and talk to us. Food is great. So, what and what a fun place to have it in Vegas. I don't think of Vegas as is is you know a, a pillar of healthy eating, but I think it's kind of a fun place to have a conference. That's, that's why we, a lot of people tell us that. The reason is because the Cleveland Clinic has a facility in Las Vegas besides the, Cle uh, the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, and that's why they picked Las Vegas after the, the conference used to be in Chicago, but after we had this massive snowstorm four years ago, they said never again in December in a place that can snow. So that's why he came to Las Vegas. Uh, that's great. That's terrific. Well, thank you so much for sharing your passion and your expertise with us. I'll, I'll just a ask one final question because I forgot to ask it, and I love to ask almost everybody I interview this. Who has inspired you most in your life? Who inspired me most? Yeah, it doesn't have to be somebody in the plant-based world. It could be your, you know, your parents, but I just that helps me, you know, just know a little bit more about you personally. Oh, okay. Um, in general, the person the person that made me learn the most was my mom in terms of um, learning, you know, about life and changes and all of that. With my from my dad, I learned my attitude, you know, always being happy, always positive. So I learned from both. Um, basically, that's where I would say. And then from outside. The blog post today says, Tony Robbins, I've always loved his book. Mm. So that was when I was already in my 20s, you know. But I think we learn, really learn who we are and a lot of these other things from our parents. So I would have to say my parents. That's, that's terrific. Uh, and are your, have you been able to get your parents to go to a plant-based diet at this point? I, my mom 
tries and right. she's interested. She just says that I don't give her enough recipes for her to try. <laughs> but give, give she's me her, vegetarian. Okay, so. I'll give, I'll give, give me her. Is she still in? Is, is she still in Rio? I'll, I'll send her my book. Yes, yeah, she is. <laughs> That's funny. She sounds great. Well, thank you so much, Roseanne. It's been such a pleasure talking to you, and keep doing what you're doing because we need you. Thank you, AJ. Always a pleasure. Great. And thanks to all of you for listening to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious. <laughs>